Good afternoon. Happy July 4th and happy Sunday. We're glad that you have chosen to worship God as we celebrate the anniversary of our wonderful country. And uh, I've prepared a message from God's Word that I think is appropriate to the truth of the teaching of Scripture, but is also appropriate for the celebration of our independence. The sermon is based on uh, the Scripture recorded by in Psalm 33, beginning in verse 12, where the psalmist writes, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, the horse cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive from famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. And then I want to read a, a text from the 12th chapter of Genesis. Beginning verse 1, 2, and 3. The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. For I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. That was God's promise to Abram. I believe that's God's promise to America. Let's pray. Father, on this day in which we celebrate our country's independence, we pray, I pray that you would remind us that we can remain independent only as long as we live in dependence upon you, depending upon you for direction, for truth, for guidance. I pray that you would honor this message today. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the best way to learn how to really appreciate America is to spend some time somewhere else. I believe I could say spend some time almost anywhere else. It's been an illuminating experience for me down through the years to listen to people who have gone out on mission trips to other countries. When they come home, they never again take lightly or for granted how blessed we are as a nation. Five times I have gone with church groups to Haiti. On each of those trips, we have had opportunity to visit schools and homes and churches in the countryside where we witnessed and sometimes I preached. In Haiti, there is so much poverty, squalor, fear, repression, and superstition. Voodoo is still rampant there. I remember once when we were dedicating a nutrition center that our church had built, several public officials came. 
came to a worship service in a church facility accompanied by bodyguards who had machine guns. That's right. They brought those machine guns right into church. And believe me, I didn't say a word in protest. What a scary place Haiti is. I've often said Haiti is the best place I ever left. And I could also say that America is the best place I've ever come home to. It disturbs me that so many want to make America the whipping boy for all the problems and for all that seems wrong in the world. Friends, I know our country is far from perfect. I know there is much about our past that all of us wish were different. I know there is much about our present that we wish were not as it is. But despite that, I have no inclination whatsoever to move anywhere else in the world because I don't believe there's any place else in the world that's better or even as good as America. And evidently, most Americans agree with my estimation. I don't know of many Americans who are trying to leave our country, not even those Hollywood celebrities who said before a past election that they'd leave America if a certain candidate for president was elected. Well, that candidate was elected, but I noticed that none of them left. Tens of thousands of people all around the world are hoping and praying and trying to immigrate to America. And I don't blame them. I want them to do it legally. But if I lived anywhere else in the world and had a chance to immigrate to America, I'd take, I'd take advantage of it. Think about this. Those immigrants, by their aspirations and efforts, are saying what I'm trying to say today. America, you're beautiful. As we celebrate once more our nation's independence, we thank God for America. We thank God for blessing America. For America is indeed a blessed nation. As Christians, we know that. Let me tell you something else we Christians know. We not only know we are a blessed nation, but we also know who the blesser is. We are a nation blessed by God. The question I want us to consider and seek an answer to today is, where is the evidence of that? What is the confirming evidence that the United States of America is blessed by God and why God has chosen to bless America so much? Please consider first that we are a nation blessed by God because of our character, our character. The American people are, by and large, good people. Oh, I know that we're sinners. I don't deny that. And I certainly don't belittle the gravity of that. But despite that, I believe there is an underlying sense of goodness and decency and fairness and justice that permeates our national character. Though the statistics on crime and violence and corruption and perversion we read about in the newspaper and hear about in the media seem to point to another conclusion. The truth is that those these blights are growing, and we ought to be alarmed by that. Those who participate in such things still represent a small minority of our population. The typical American is a decent, honest, hardworking, law-abiding, even God-fearing citizen who is alarmed by those disturbing and distressing trends in our society and culture. The truth is that the character of America is good because the character of most Americans is good. 
the writer of Proverbs reminds us, righteousness exalts a nation. America's righteousness is a fruit of our Judeo-Christian heritage. And it is out of that heritage, you see, that we have such a highly developed sense of right and wrong, honesty and fairness, justice and truth. We are a liberty-loving nation. And we have short patience with those who treat these virtues lightly. The Romans used to complain that Jews and Christians in their empire did not make good slaves because something in their religion made them unfit for subjugation. So it was then, so it continues to be. Our biblical heritage has left an indelible imprint upon the character of our people and thus of our nation. Over 150 years ago, Alex de Tocqueville, a French observer and writer, visited America. Upon his return home, Mr. Tocqueville wrote these words. I sought for greatness in America, in her harbors and rivers and fertile fields, in her mines and natural resources and vigorous commerce. It was not there. Not until I went into America's churches and heard her pulpits aflame with the truth of God and righteousness did I understand the goodness of America. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. We are a nation blessed by God because of our character. Consider second that America is a nation blessed by God because of our charity, our charity. The typical American is the most generous, benevolent, charitable, giving person in the world. No other nation, no other people in history has ever done so much for people in need here in our own country and also around the world. One surprising thing that is provable evidence of the benevolent nature of America is the proliferation of so many bogus charities, so the bogus charities in our land. Con artists make millions and millions of dollars each year just by publicizing some so-called but really untrue charity. They know that a certain percentage of Americans will respond and respond generously to any appeal. Don't you see? It's our very gullibility that is a reflection of our national good-heartedness. And while I hate to see selfish charlatans get away with such hypocritical deception and fraud, I say, thank God. Thank God we're that, that kind of people instead of selfish, miserly, hard-hearted, uncaring, uncompassionate people. When Americans see people in need, sick, hungry, homeless, suffering as a result of unemployment, underemployment, disaster, or calamity, we respond, and we respond generously. We are a charitable people. Whenever there are floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, tsunamis, volcanic eruption, famines, plagues, pestilence, natural disasters of any sort, we always respond. We respond to those disasters not only here in America, but all over the world. And while we're certainly not the only nation that does this, no other nation does it to the extent that America does. God is pleased when our hearts respond and our hands and pocketbooks reach out to those in need at home or abroad. America is a nation blessed by God because of our charity. Consider third, that America is a nation blessed by God because of our charter. Our charter. A noted historian asked this question, what makes a nation great? 
Then he answered his own question. First, it must have a sense of spiritual destiny. Second, it must have a determination to endure. And third, it must look forward and not backward. These three requisites throughout human history have determined greatness in a nation. Focus for a moment, if you will, on that first requisite. To be a great nation, a nation must have a sense of spiritual destiny. If ever a nation was founded with a sense of spiritual destiny, it was America. Roger Babson tells of a meeting with the president of Argentina. Mr. Babson, the president, said, I've been wondering why it is that South America, with all of its natural resources, its vast stores of iron, copper, coal, silver, and gold, its great rivers and waterfalls that rival even Niagara, why is South America so far behind North America in the standard of living for the majority of its citizens? Mr. President, what do you think is the reason? Babson asked. The president pondered for a few moments before he replied and said, I've come to this conclusion. South America was settled by those who were in search of gold, while North America was settled by those who were in search of God. Dear friends, he's right. Other parts of the New World were colonized by those who were seeking gold. America was colonized primarily by those who were seeking God, seeking a place where they could freely worship and serve God, live according to His will, His laws, His principles, and the precepts of His kingdom. Our founding fathers understood the distinctiveness of this. In 1765, John Adams wrote, I have always considered the settlement of America with wonder and reverence as the opening of a grand scheme and divine design for the emancipation of humankind. That is our purpose. That is our destiny. That is America's charter. Our national charter comes out of a sense of God's divine purpose for us. Listen once again to the words that God spoke to Abraham so many centuries ago. Leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land that I will show you and I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing and all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Friends, I don't know about you, but to me it almost sounds as if God could have been speaking of our founding fathers and to millions of others who have left their homelands and immigrated here. Do you see what God had in mind for Israel? He had in mind that he would bless Israel as a nation so that in turn Israel as a nation might be a blessing to others. God blessed Israel so that Israel might be God's channel of blessing to the whole world. I believe that God had that same thing in mind for America. He has blessed us. He does bless us so that we might in turn, as a blessed nation, be a blessing, a beacon of hope, a model to others of what can happen when a nation acknowledges God, honors God, respects God, reveres God, trusts and obeys God, has a sense of spiritual destiny under the divine hand of God. That is our charter. We cannot escape the intuition that God has a divine destiny for our nation, to be sure. There have been times in our history we, when we have forgotten or paid little attention to our destiny, our purpose, or our charter. 
But when that happens, we bring upon ourselves, and when that happens, we bring upon ourselves consequences that usually turn us back in repentance to God and recall us to our natural purpose that we are blessed in order to be a blessing. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shores. Send these, the homeless, the tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. These are the words I suspect you know, penned by Emma Lazarus and inscribed at the base of the Statue of Liberty. Whenever I see those words, I'm reminded of the story about a family that went to visit that historic site while they were in New York City. Their six-year-old daughter was awestruck by the sight and size of that statue, looking at wonder at that great lady holding high the torch. That night, the little girl was restless, couldn't sleep. Her daddy went to her and asked, Honey, what's the matter? Why can't you sleep? The little girl replied, I keep on thinking about that lady with the torch. Her arm must get so tired. Don't you think somebody ought to help her hold it up? Sisters and brothers, let me say to you today that for almost 250 years, Millions and millions of Americans, each in our own way, have been helping to hold up the torch of liberty and the flame of truth. We are a nation blessed by God to be a blessing. That is America's charter. We are blessed by God because of our charter. Good news, good news, good news. Because God has blessed America, America can continue to be a blessing. And when we are willing to be a blessing, willing to be God's channel of blessing, true to our character, true in our charity, true to our charter, then it is that God himself says, America, you're beautiful. Dear Father, we thank you that we are a blessed nation, not because we have earned your blessings, not because we deserve your blessing, but because in your grace and goodness you have chosen to bless us. We pray that in response to your blessings, we might so conduct our lives and our witness that we might be a blessing to you and a blessing for you in your world, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless America, and God bless you. Hope I'll see you in worship next Lord's Day.